Good afternoon and welcome to today's UNM Taos presentation, Cultural Appreciation or Appropriation. We are so glad you're joining us today in spite of the cold and snowy weather. And we'll get started with our programming in just a few moments, but, but first I'd like to share some Zoom housekeeping announcements. Uh, first, you'll see for security purposes, today's session is set up as a webinar, which means only the panelists and host videos will be available. Attendee videos and audio is not enabled. However, we do have a few ways for attendees to engage. First, the chat feature is currently enabled and will remain open during the opening remarks. We invite you to use this chat feature to introduce yourselves, if you, if you wish, by entering your name uh, and if you wish to your, your uh, title, organization, and tribal affiliation. The bottom toolbar of the menu, uh, you'll see a single chat, uh, conversation bubble icon with chat. If you click on that, it will open up that feature. We also have the Q&A feature ena enabled, so you can submit questions to the presenters, which we will facilitate the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, to open up the Q&A, also look at the bottom toolbar of your Zoom screen and you'll see a double conversation bubble icon. If you click on that, you'll see where you can enter in your questions to submit. We do ask that you keep chat comments and questions courteous, respectful, and relevant to today's topic. We trust that you will honor that request, although we do reserve the right to disable either or both of those features if you deemed necessary. We would also like to share that the session is being recorded and stream live at the UNM Taos Facebook page at facebook.com slash UNM Taos. I'll be putting that in the chat box in just a moment. So moving into our programming, it is my pleasure to introduce the hosts and panelists for today's event, Turquoise Chanoa Velarde, the Student Program Specialist for Student and Cultural Programming, and Myra S. Gutierrez Ramirez, the Student Success Specialist for our Upward Bound Math and Science programs. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Chanoa. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Anita, for that wonderful introduction and those announcements. Um, I'd like to also thank Myra for being on this call with us today and for agreeing to support this initiative um, through her cultural lens and through her own perspective. Um, my name is Shanoa Velarde, and I come from the Pueblo of Taos and the Hickory Apache Nation. And I am, as Anita mentioned, a student program specialist for UNM Taos. So the things that I do on campus are many. I wear many hats. Um, one of the things that I do on campus is cultural programming. And so cultural programming can really mean a lot of things. During this time of year, we often focus on things like Hispanic Heritage Month, the ending of Hispanic Heritage Month, and then going into our Halloween and Dia de los Muertos um, traditions and holidays. Um, so today is really about honoring each other's perspectives and I want to thank you all for joining us and uh, for giving us your ear um, to these very, very sensitive topics. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and we're going to get going. So um, here we go. So today's uh, webinar is going to be on the topic of cultural appropriation or appreciation. Um, I'm going to start first and here we go. So I wanted to start with some definitions. I know that I don't want to make my, I didn't want to make, I did not intend for my presentation to be so um, word heavy, but I feel like it's appropriate to include these definitions prior to my presentation. So the definition of cultural appropriation, the taking over of creative or artistic forms, themes or practices of a marginalized cult culture by a dominant culture without their input, settler colonialism, US policies and actions related to indigenous peoples, through often termed racist or discriminatory, um, they are rarely depicted as what they are, indigenous peoples. Classic cases on imperialism, a particular form of colonialism. Settler colonialism is a genocidal policy. Border town violence, towns that are nearby reservations that are economically dependent on indigenous peoples and that neighbor native nations. Oops. So Native American stereotypes are ingrained in the fabric of our country as historical people, as tribal and inferior. Most contemporary depictions of Native Americans include the noble savage, redskins, spiritual beings, creatures fit for mascots. These are the images that we see when we're represented in massive media, and this is the experience that our children are having. 
The fictions that maintain separatism and discrimi discrimination within cultural appropriation are things like the false narratives about Columbus, the discoverer, tolerating Disney's romanticized version of Pocahontas, encouraging our students to make paper headdresses, and then in the process during Thanksgiving, encouraging them to make a mockery of sacred tradition. The problem is when negative stereotype images like this surround us every day, the problem is when they start to get normalized. Cultural appropriation is a violation of intellectual property that our current legal, legal system is not set up to protect. Because most culture property is collectively owned, um, it's, it's very hard to put that on in paper and um, in terms of law. Additionally, the groups that are using these cultural images are making money, while the Native communities are not seeing any of these profits or benefits from this use. Morally, cultural appropriation is taking away the unique identities that make Native people who they are and mass producing them for sale to the general public. The main issue of cultural appropriation as situated in a colonial power structure that exhibits settler dominated society um, is the taking from that marginalized community. So why do these representations matter? Why in 2020 do we still need to be having conversations about Tonto and Hollywood Indians, mascots and red face, and how these images have weight and importance in our continued survivance as indigenous peoples? So some of the things that I wanted to talk about in this slide are things like economic harms of cultural appropriation. Um, a lot of folks seem to understand things like money and law in the current age. So in a way, economic harm is the complete disregard for intellectual property within this context. This leads into things like trademark and copyright infringement. The Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990 that protects Native artisans from misrepresentation. So basically, it is the appropriating group benefiting monetarily often and Natives that are not. The moral and cultural arguments for this um, are pretty broad, but what I came up with is that, uh, that this type of cultural appropriation interfere, interferes with a community's ability to define and establish its own identity. So an example is that, um, for instance, these are the things that make me Pueblo, Apache, and Potawatomi. And then we have urban outfitters saying, no, 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 actually, these are the things that make us urban outfitters. These are the things that make us spirit Halloween. Um, and it interferes with indigenous people's ability to draw those boundaries of who we are. So um, why is it a problem? Um, the, this contributes to stereotyping all of these images. They are one-sided, plains Indians most often, and it collapses the diversity of our communities down into a one-dimensional stereotype. It is an exploitation of indigenous identity. So this, the image that you see on the screen here is uh, an image of Disney's Pocahontas. Um, despite what many people believe due to longstanding and inaccurate accounts in history books um, and movies like Disney's Pocahontas, the true story of Pocahontas is not one of a young native Powhatan woman with a raccoon friend who dove off of mountain-like cliffs off the coasts of Virginia. Um, there are actually no coasts on the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, there are actually no cliffs on the coasts of Virginia. Um, the story of Pocahontas or Matoaka is a tragic tale of a young native girl who was kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and allegedly murdered by those who were supposed to keep her safe. The image you see in front of you is a rendition of Matoaka or Pocahontas and her father, Chief Pahaan. In the midst of the horrible and atrocious acts committed by English colonists during the 1600s, Matoaka was coming of age. Uh, she was the daughter of the chief, married at 14 to a young warrior and soon became pregnant. As colonists terrorized Native people, Pocahontas married and became pregnant. In the early 1600s, it was a very horrible time for tribes um, near what's called Wero Komoko. Um, excuse me if I mispronounce that. Native tribes once comfortable, were once comfortable wearing things that were suitable for summer. Uh, most often, Native women exposed breasts um, mainly for breastfeeding, um, for, the, for the easy um, access to children and their food, and um, oftentimes children wore little to nothing. Um, they found themselves being sexually targeted by English colonists. 
Young children were targets of rape and native women in the tribe were, would resort to offering themselves to men to keep their children safe. The Paha and people were shocked by this behavior and were horrified that the English government offered them no protections. Pocahontas was kidnapped when she was 15 or 16. Her husband was murdered and she was forced to give up her first child. For fear of violence and retaliation by the English colonist, um, Matoaka was not rescued. Uh, she was raped while in captivity and became pregnant with her second child. She was held on a ship off the coast of her home village. Eventually, she was converted to Christianity and took the name Rebecca. She was never allowed to see her family, a child, or her father after being kidnapped. Though many settlers were committing atrocities against the Powhatan people, um, many elites in England to show friendship with Native nations was their key to continued financial support to stay in uh, the Americas. Um, so Pocahontas did get taken over to England to basically be showcased as friendly relationships between Native people and the English colonists. Um, Pocahontas did die in 1617 in England. She was just under 21. And instead of being taken home to be laid to rest in her homelands with her father, uh, Motoaka was buried at St. George's Church in Gravesend, England. She was the first missing and murdered Indigenous woman. And still today, she has never been returned home. Oh, shoot, sorry. <laughs> um, women's costumes are highly sexualized. We as a community deal with violence against women and sexual violence against women in Native communities and the over-sexualization of women as well. When the only images you see of Native women are that they're very sexually available, of, um, that this is something that becomes normalized, it does translate to the experiences of contemporary Native women. The descriptions that they tend to use with these costumes um, are pretty atrocious. I don't want to. I don't want to go into that, um, but they they are very very detailed, um, often suggesting sexual acts or um, things that are very uncomfortable to Native women. For Native women and all of women, women of color, it is this combination between the race as identity as well as the identity of being a woman. So these two marginalized identities coming together um, basically creates a recipe that those identities cannot be separated. The act of placing us in a historic past constantly and complete invisibility means that we are being misrepresented or not represented at all. Um, and both of those are equally dangerous for our communities and for the mental health of our youth. Um, so let me just, just give me one second. Let me just delete that so you can see the bigger. Um, so that being said, the murder rate from Native American First Nations women and girls across the country is 10 times higher than other ethnicities. The average age of those missing and murdered is 29. Four out of five of our Native women are affected by violence today. The U.S. Department of Justice found that American Indian women face murder rates that are, than, that are more than 10 times the national average. The CDC and Prevention Homicide found that homicide is the third leading, leading cause of death among 10 to 24 years of age and the fifth leading cause of death for American Indian and Alaska Native women between the ages of 25 and 34 years old. So this image that you see in front of you um, is from the Urban Indian Health Institute and it showcases really their study on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in our country. Um, at the time, there were over 2,000. In 2016, there were over 2,000 reported cases of missing or murdered indigenous women. And 506 of those cases were identified across 700 urban cities, um, selected urban cities, and that does include Albuquerque. Uh, 128 of these cases um, were missing Indigenous women, 200 of them were murdered Indigenous women, and 90 of Native, 98 of those cases were uh, um, as of now unknown status, um, and again 29 is the median age of uh, victims. So coming back to stereotypes. The male version of the noble savage is the brave or the chief. He is pe peaceful, kills only to eat or to defend his family, and is not wasteful. The brave is a spiritual mystic guardian of the land who exists in harmony with and as an icon of America's wilderness past, as if he were an eagle or a buffalo rather than a human. He is often represented in picturesque nature, showcasing some natural skill or admired for its primitive purity. 
he, like hunting buffalo or riding a horse, the brave imagery usually includes excessive traditional dress, especially a splendid headdress, thereby <clears throat> reinforcing his flawless natural naturalness. As a mythic icon of the past, the brave lacks humanity. So consequentially, the brave is al always shown as stoic, lacking any real emotion, especially humor. Uh, the section also includes um, imagery that romanticize the traditional native lifestyle um, because it is a key part of brave or chief depiction. So on the screen here, you can see on the left, a mock headdress. You can see um, from the earlier parts, um, times of our country, you can see advertisements, big chief, big chief, um, based on like to tobacco, I believe there was a big chief flower. Um, the bottom one you can see big chief pinball machines and you can see that they're all with headdress. They all look peaceful for the most part, but they all have um, markings on their faces and a romanticized kind of look to them. On the right, you see Peter Pan. You see the big chief of Peter Pan and Peter Pan wearing a headdress. Um, to be honest, growing up, I thought this was the coolest part of Peter Pan because I thought, wow, at least there's something in, in Disney that um, not exactly pays homage, but recognizes who I am as an indigenous person. Um, granted everything about that specific scene and the representation of native peoples in peter pan is completely inaccurate um, and then on the bottom of that image you see caricature more more of that caricature feel of um chief or um like the the indian brave um oftentimes all of these images all, if not all of the time they are made by non-native people Okay. So uh, um, before we start this one, I want to talk a little bit about identity. Native peoples are never going to be more than 2% of the entire U.S. population. Um, it's pretty complicated. It's not just about having heritage. It's also about having a connection to a community. It's about relationships, who claims you and who do you claim, and that those relationships to tribal nations come with a level of responsibility to that specific nation. Um, but there are exceptions, things like when we had genocidal policies in the U.S. that removed Native children from their communities, and a lot of those children didn't come back into their communities or reintegrate back until later in life. So I would say those are exceptions in terms of identity. Generations of settler colonialism, um, those individuals are still in the process of rebuilding their connections. We are in an age where native land rights and water and the things we deeply care about are under attack. And in many ways, when we have folks without that deep connection to the land and their community, claiming the identity and also falsifying an identity for fun or for fashion, um, a lot of the general population looks to them as spokespeople um, that may not be in support of the true causes that indigenous peoples care about. And it does take away that primary claim to land and sovereignty that native people have. It delegitimizes de the, um, the fact that they're indigenous or they're representing indigenous, um, then I'm indigenous. And so it takes away the, that primacy of identity. Um, it basically says, well, they're wearing it and maybe they're native or they're wearing it and maybe they work near native people. Um, either way, it, it's still an identity issue. Um, so what you see in front of you is the traditional native mas mascots um, that have so much, that are such a staple in our communities, um, in our national community and our national conversations. And so these mascots um, are harmful to Native youth because they show Native youth that this is the only image that we know of you and this is the only image that we're gonna go with. We're just gonna roll with it. We're not gonna go to each tribal nation and find out the beauty and the um, diversity, the cultural diversity of each of you. We're gonna lump you into one image. So what you see in front of you is the Braves image um, I believe it's the Atlanta Braves, and then the Redskins image. And the cool thing about the Redskins um, mascot is that they actually change their mascot. They are no longer the Washington Redskins. They are the Washington team. Um, there have been so many different organizations across the country, as well as different spokespeople for Indian, Indian, Indian country, what they call Indian country, um, that have spoken out against this very harmful 
narrative of indigenous people. And so because of their plight, and I wanna pay respect and homage to those who came before me who have really paved the way to change native mascots. And it really did come from the perspective and the foundation of Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matters movement this summer. Um, we saw the Washington Redskins change their name in June of 2020 um, after countless years of lawsuits of um, outspoken indigenous activists, um, even children, you know, speaking out on these images, it took this long and a movement of, like Black Lives Matter to truly change things. Um, more specifically, it took the FedEx CEO to put pressure on the Washington Redskins team to change their name. So really it should have been done, you know, prior to all of these things. Um, and what's even worse is that the Washington team is placed or is, um, you know, part of Washington DC. And so it's, it's very much a conversation of race power relations. <clears throat> and then you see things like the um, I believe that's the Cleveland Indians. And then we have a cool little meme saying um, it's, it's, a, it's a person dressed in Indian garb with go savages on their chests with a flag saying warrior savages. And he's saying to the indigenous person, but I'm honoring you. So this is where we talk about cultural appre appreciation um, in that cultural appre appreciation does not ever and will not ever include things that you see in front of you. A lot of the times these teams and these mascots across the country claim that we're honoring you, we're honoring indigenous people. However, we know that there are beautiful representations of indigenous people. There are beautiful ways that indigenous peoples are weaving themselves into the intricacies of the society. And so for an indigenous person to see these things and to continue seeing these things, is really a paradox. It goes against our identity and our claims to identity and our claims to authenticity as well. The person in front of you is Chief Garfield Velarde Sr. He is um, my ancestor. He is Hickory Apache and he is dressed in uh, Hickory Apache um, modern clothing and then he has a headdress on. He was the last chief of the Hickory Apaches. So this topic is very, very important to me. It is very sensitive to me as well, as the Hickory Ap Apache people have been subject to many things um, across, across the span of US genocidal policies uh, in terms of American religious freedom, as well as self-determination and self-governance. Um, many, many times we often see that all of our people are kind of lumped into this one category of, well, you know, this, this image of uh, one dimensional, like I said, but we are not one dimensional. However, this image in front of you really shows the testament to the strength, resilience, and the perseverance of Native peoples today. I wouldn't be able to sit here and tell you this story um, if it wasn't for the strength and perseverance of my ancestor, Chief Garfield Sr. Um, he was given the Presidential Medal of Honor and um, he did live his life out through um, in the area of what's called Dulce, New Mexico, which is near Chama, New Mexico. Uh, that was not where they were originally placed though. The US government decided to place the Apache people in the south, I believe southwest uh, corner of, the color of Colorado. Um, and at that time, it was snowing. And so the US government said, well, you guys need to stay here, figure out how to survive. They didn't expect Apache people to survive during that time. But they came back the next winter or the next spring, the US government and found, wow, Apache people survived. Um, then at that time, they moved them to the current day Hickory Apache Reservation. And so the only reason why I'm telling you this is because I believe it's important um, to tell our story. I think that when we have one media outlet, one image telling our story, it's dangerous. It's dangerous because stories are powerful. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that image. So here I wanna talk about, you know, after you know all these things and after you're seeing the real impact, um, it might not be your intent to hurt people. It might not be your intent to encourage people to hurt people. Um, but you always want to ask things like, what can you do? 
things like understanding the significance of what you're doing. Um, here, I want to talk about the fact that there are actual traditional ceremonial practices being mocked and mimicked by non-Indigenous people. And an example of this is in Arizona when a non-Indigenous person was running a sweat lodge ceremony. And he got in a lot of trouble as people died in that ceremony that he ran. A lot of the times people look at that and say, well, what are Indigenous people really doing with sweat lodges, right? Like, what are they what are they subjecting themselves to? However, there is that intellectual property that comes into play that, wait a minute, it wasn't an Indigenous person running a sweat lodge. It was a non-Indigenous person. So we can't always let those kind of things impact us and puncture um, our true meaning of what these ceremonies and traditions mean. Um, so that's that's that question. The next one is, am I honoring this culture or simply imitating it? Um, so here in Taos County and, and in the Valley, I have not exactly come across folks who have tried to wear Pueblo, um, Pueblo wear, um, or mantas, or any of the things that we wear at the Pueblo as women. Um, I've never really come across that. And, you know, that's a really good discussion to have today, I think, is that how do we differentiate between honoring and imitating? Um, and that I think is, is um, an ongoing conversation. And the next question is, am I perpetuating a stereotype that might hurt those who belong to this culture? So for one, I think that it is very important to continue to teach our children, um, continue to teach them that these kind of things are very, very harmful to native and indigenous youth. Um, so some of the things I wanted to throw in here is that um, the ongoing struggles that continue the pattern of structural violence, not only in our towns, in our states, but across the country are things like FBI and tribal communications, um, state and tribal communications even, that's still an issue, um, overall community awareness of these issues as well. And so coming back to the last question, am I doing this as a personal opportunity to interact with and experience another culture? Or am I doing this for a photo I can post online? So that's always a great question to ask ourselves, not just with cultural appropriation, but also with things that every day we, we take for granted and um, things that we don't exactly stop to understand and stop to do the research, right? Um, so the reality of this is, is that it is a structure that is designed to cripple and assimilate our people so as to pave the way for the American dream. Um, in order to heal and move forward, um, it's essential that our children know the truth of how we came to know so much suffering and to not place blame on the colonizer um, so our children, so that they don't have to feel victimized. Um, but we want to equip our children with the truth and empower them with the vision of a better future, um, a vision that indigenous peoples all over this country are realizing all over this country every day. Um, so if you're wondering how this affects Native youth, I'm going to give you some statistics. For every 100 Native students that start ninth grade, 50 will graduate high school. 20 of those graduates will go on to higher education and one will graduate from college. It takes 2,500 native ninth graders to create one native master's graduate and 7,000 native ninth graders to create one native PhD. Now the connections that we see here with not only this stereotype typing, um, but also the settler colonialism and the settler colonial legacy is that native ninth graders do not see themselves in curriculum. They don't see themselves in their schools. They don't see their knowledges or their intelligence honored. And even more so, they see this widespread one dimensional image of what's supposed to be them in a way and in, in a lot of studies as well. Um, this contributes to identity loss. This contributes to self-harm for our Native youth. Um, the CDC in 2013 rated American Indian and Alaska Native youth um, the highest rates of suicide among youth aged 18 to 24. So it's a, it's a huge thing. It's, it's a worldwide um, 
all over this world, right? But specifically for this country, that those are those rates are way too high, especially when we're talking about us being not more than two percent of the U.S. population. So we need we need us. We need Native youth. We need their intelligence. We need their hearts. We need their minds. American Indian and Alaska Native women and men are not make believe characters for us to dress up as or to teach our kids to play as. They are real human beings living and breathing in our community. Um, today, let's make an effort, let's all make an effort to avoid costumes which ex um, exoticize American Indians and, 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 and indigenous women um, or any ethnic group for that matter. Let's remember that indigenous people are still here. Let's remember that we, we very much see ourselves as beautiful, as strong and as resilient. Um, I want to show this video because it's important to know that, or to see at least, that um, what, what Indigenous people are doing today. This video in front of you that I'm about to show you is all Indigenous curated. It's all Indigenous created. Um, the models, the music that you hear playing, the scenery that you see, and also the filmmaker. Um, the film editor and all those in the end credits who have helped to make this beautiful video is, is just showing you a glimpse, just a tiny glimpse of what Native people are today, what Indigenous people are doing, and how they're putting themselves into these worldwide arenas like fashion um, to tell our story from our point of view and from our eyes. <laughs> video. Um, okay, so here we are still. Um, I just wanted to say thank you all for listening to me today. Um, I'm here for questions. I'm here for comments. Um, I think that, you know, to end this, hold on, sorry, to end this conversation, um, I think that it's really important to keep having them and, and not to end them. Um, I think that it's important to continue to support our children. And I'll end with this, this, this note is that it is our responsibility as indigenous peoples to create our own image, to tell our own stories. And it is our responsibility to our children and our communities. Thank you.
So now I'm gonna, we're gonna uh, transition into Myra, Myra's presentation. Um, Myra, I've been working with Myra since 2015. I'm very grateful always for her support and her recognition of also indigenous peoples in this area. We've had some great conversations regarding what this really means to us. And up until today, we've had great conversations about cultural appropriation. She's worked on, with me on many projects at UNM Taos. Um, and I do appreciate her openness and her willingness to work with me. Um, so I present to you, Myra, and um, I want to say that, you know, Myra, I'm, I'm very grateful that you were able to share space with me today to talk about these sensitive things. Um, and here we go. Thank you, Shanoa. Uh, thank you for that amazing presentation. I really enjoyed everything you, you talked about and that video was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mayra Gutierrez Ramirez and today I will be talking a little bit about my perspective on, you know, cultural appropriation and also a holiday that follows, um, you know, Halloween that's uh, approaching us uh, quickly this month and that would be Dia de los Muertos. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just start my presentation and give me a, just a minute so that I can get that going. So cultural appropriation has not been something that, like Chanoa said, is new. Um, there have been campaigns, um, like for example, oh, how university started a campaign that's called Wear a Culture, Not a Costume. And, and then the University of Denver also um, continued on with some of those initiatives and also did a, compa a campaign in their university in 2015. So this, Unfortunately, we there's it's, it's something that continues to happen each year, and it, this is why it's so important for us to have continue to have this conversation so that we can educate ourselves and you know um, educate our families, uh, our 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 little ones, our siblings, um, so that we can create a culture that stops this. So we create a, a culture that really recognizes cultures and appreciates um, the diversity that we can offer and um, contribute to each other. Um, so I really like uh, Northern Arizona also um, join on with this campaign and in here you will see a, a few questions that um, that I think are important in terms of whether you whether if you have questions whether your costume is um, you know, being be is is being cultural appropriated. Um, one would be: Does it perpetrate racist stereotypes? Could choosing to wear this costume be harmful or offensive to others? So these are really uh, good questions. That if you answer no, then you're doing your part, and it's not considered appropriation. Um, these are costumes that I've seen that really target the Mexican community. I and to me, when I see these costumes, I, I see uh, there's the, first of all, they are really perpetrating the, neg uh, it's a negative uh, stereotype that's being illustrated here. As a Mexican woman, you know, I, I already grow, uh, I have to grow up with a lot of negative stereotypes as it is, as a student, as a teenager, as a young adult. And if I would have listened to those stereotypes, I probably would not be in the situation that I am now. I am a first generation student. Luckily, I was able to uh, you know, a, a pursue a post-secondary education and I got a, uh, have a master's degree. But all of these examples illustrate um, you know, the stereotypes that make you question like, who you are. Growing up, like I said, we're battling so many stereotypes as it is, skin, ethnicity, language, income status, first generation, not being uh, part of this of this land, of this country. And all of those, uh, all of those things affect us as youth, as you know, as individuals who have to live in these, who live in these communities. Um, my, my goal in high school, to be honest, was to just graduate high school and at least be the first one in my family to graduate from high school. Um, but um, thanks to programs, you know, like college and career prep, I was able to, um, 
get the, the the services and the and the support that I needed to to ignore those those stereotypes and like I said pursue a post secondary education. Um, these are some of the examples that I found um, through this website and organization. And like I said, may, not all the voices um, in our presentation today will be heard. Um, it would be good to have a conversation, a continuous conversation where we can bring in more people, hear your stories, hear like uh, bring more students and really have a conversation around this. And maybe this is something that we can grow maybe in the, within the next upcoming year. Um, because I think this is really important. Um, in terms of, so the other part that I wanted to talk to you guys about is Dia de los Muertos. And Dia de los Muertos is not a Mexican Halloween. Um, November 1st is All Saints Day and November 2nd is All Souls Day. So the first on Saints Day, we, we truly honor uh, the children that have passed away and on the second is when we honor everyone, the, the children, the adults, everybody comes into this picture. Um, the other Los Muertos, um, I'll use the definition that Mecca from Houston used, which is the other Los Muertos is a culmination of pre-Columbian heritage and uh, Catholic influence honoring the souls of the death in a lively, cheerful celebration. Our ancestors and dearly departed are began to return in a spirited show of music, dance, and theater, visual arts, and most essentially through displays of arts and of um, altars and ofrendas. So yes, during Dia de los Muertos, we have a tradition of setting up these beautiful altars in our homes. Um, we go into the cemeteries, and you know we provide. Um, we color them with flowers, we color them with um, el uh, elements that represent fire, earth, wind. Um, for the children, we put uh, toys that they, you know, little toys that they would have played with, that they enjoyed, maybe clothing of the deceased. Um, there's a lot of things that go into these ofrendas because we really want to honor them and for us, it's a, it's a time to remember their sacrifices, a time to um, tell their stories and be able to share the stories with our, with our, with our family and remember them in this, beautiful, um, in this beautiful tradition that has been going on for over 3,000 years now. Um, so again, Dia de los Muertos is not our Halloween, it's not our Mexican Halloween, but again, it's, it's more of a spir spiritual tradition. Um, as you would see here, these um, again are some of the how the the ofrendas and the elements that would that would go into these ofrendas. Um, another part of the de los Muertos is this imagery of La Catrina, right? Um, so Jose Guadalupe Posada in 1910 uh, was known as a political cartoonist, and through the creation of La Calavera which is the image you see here, uh, the original purpose was to remind people not to pretend to be someone you weren't. That it didn't matter if you were rich, poor, or the color of your skin, always stay true to yourself and remember that in death, we are all going to the same place. So um, later in 1947, Diego Rivera painted a mural called The Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in the Alameda Central. And Diego paints the La Calavera in an elegant, in elegant clothing. And from that point forward, she became the icon that we see today in a lot of our celebrations when it comes to Dia de los Muertos. Um, so just, just a little bit of a, of a history behind why we, um, why she is a, a, a big icon in a lot of our celebrations, why we paint our faces, why we, make sugar skulls and we put them in our altares and we just it's, it's a huge celebration where we remember to honor the death and the living um so when i think about a, the cultural uh, cultural appropriation i also think about cultural appreciation and uh, we live in a multicultural society that is fluid and has thriving cultures and instead of you know there we have opportunities to come together to come together in spaces where we can learn from each other, from the people, from the history 
uh, learn from our struggles. I think learning from one another is what will um, make us um, better people. And it would also, I think in a way, it, it will empower us to not be ashamed of who we are and, and on the contrary, embrace our differences. We all have something very special and unique to offer. And, you know, um, yes, we, we have a lot of um, cultural uh, stereotypes and a lot of challenges in society already. Um, just come together and help one another um, be successful in whatever endeavors we may have, whether it's um, as a upper bound, you know, student success specialist, one of my main goals is to uh, help students um, realize that and get them prepared for a post-secondary education because that's something that everyone um, can obtain and it is accessible. And we are in a, in a good and a perfect community where we have a campus and we can go ahead and start our education here and, and move forward into a bachelor's by transferring either to uh, Albuquerque, uh, Las Cruces, whichever university of, of your choosing, but we, there's opportunities and you guys, and you, and you can get it done. Um, I always tell the students, I know it was a challenge. I've been through it. I've been through a lot of uh, struggles and challenges myself as a Mexicana, mujer, um, and um, there's, it, it is difficult, but together uh, we can get it done. Thank you so much for giving me a few times, a uh, few minutes of your time to to listen to our presentation. I um, I am grateful for this opportunity. Thank you so much to Shanoa and Myra for not only your willingness to hold this presentation um, and to share from your perspectives and your personal experiences and stories but for doing so in, in such a, a wonderfully open and um, personal and um, poised and graceful way that you did. I think I can speak for all of us that are joining today that uh, we're all leaving today a little bit more informed and aware of our actions and behavior and assumptions that may not only be inappropriate, but also can be very, very hurtful as, as Shanoa pointed out very eloquently in her presentation, as well as learning ways that that we can be better and do better and learn more. So thank you both so very much. I, I do wanna open up, we have a few minutes before our, our closing time of 1 p.m. Um, so I'd like to open up to the attendees to submit any questions. Uh, please do use the Q&A feature for that so the questions don't get lost there in the chat box. Uh, we do have one question that has come up um, and this is to Shanoa. Uh, recently, uh, it says you have brought up how we in Taos tend to invite Taos Pueblo representatives to provide an opening prayer or invocations for many of our community programs and events. On one hand, I think it's a sincere desire to be inclusive, but it may seem to be just a token of including Native Americans. What are your thoughts about this? And Chano, if you can uh, speak to that. Hi, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question, Kathleen. Um, I've, I've brought this up many times uh, in my work in that um, it's not just about what we do as a campus community, but it's also what our community does as a community. Many times I've been to places that honor uh, Taos Pueblo people um, in my community, organizations that you know have special honoring, special awards, special recognition for Taos Pueblo tribal members. And often I do and don't see our, um, ourselves represented. So I'll give an example. For one, I think that um, the main thing that I see is that my work is very, very much uh, entailed to the respect of protocol for our community. So what that means is that, yes, asking the governor to do a blessing and being inclusive in that way, um, or even our war chief staff, um, or anyone for that matter from the Taos Pueblo tribal government. Um, but I think more importantly is, is how we use their voice or how their voice is used within that programming. So I often say that, yes, we are very prayerful people. We are very spiritual people, but we're more than that. You know, we, we, we show up at events and we can provide a prayer um, to open an event or to close an event, but we're more than just a prayer, right? We're academics, we're 
student program specialists, we're um, fashion designers, we're all these amazing, beautiful things. And so one of the things that I think is most important is also giving Indigenous peoples not only that honor and recognition to support events, but also giving Indigenous peoples a place at the event, giving them a chance to show their perspective, to show what their lens looks like, right? And not dis disconnecting that from the wholeness of where your event is at, right? So oftentimes I go to these events and I'm like, well, wait a minute, you're situated on ancestral Pueblo territory. Let's Let's talk about what we're doing now. Let's talk about all the intelligence and knowledge that we still carry besides prayers, right? Prayers are great and they're beautiful, but we're more than that. And, and, and there's power in that. Thank you again for that question and for that, that very well poised response, Shanoa. Um, we do have another question and this one is for Myra. Uh, how do you see the quote unquote Chicano culture adopting and representing these ideologies, but not accept the cultural background of being Mexican? I think that's a challenge that, um, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard question. Um, I think I felt a little bit of that as, as I was growing up because everything around you tells you that you don't necessarily belong here. You're, you don't see your history. You're not learned, you, you know, in your classes, you don't, you're not being taught your, your, the Mexican, you know, the history behind uh, what happened. And, um, and that's a journey in itself. I think we need to have opportunities where we can come together to have these discussions and learn about where we came from and at the end of the day, you will have, I mean, we, we all will have the choice of whether you be, uh, hopefully you'll be honoring and feeling proud of where you came from, but it, it's going to take an effort to, as people to come together and really have those, uh, those conversations to, to listen to. Um, um, for me, for example, I really didn't, I wasn't aware of much of my heritage. Um, and a lot of it was because when I was, I, I grew, I was born in Mexico, my, my, my family brought us to, to California, I grew up there, and sometime around in high school, I moved to Taos, so I felt like I, was, I wasn't sure where I belonged, I wasn't sure if I was like, what part, where, where do I fit in, so you have these questions, and yes, there's this, this this thing of acculturation that goes on. It's like you're no, you're doesn't that tries to strip your identity, who you are, um, for for a long time. I was even embarrassed to speak Spanish, and that was the language that I spoke in my house. Uh, so all of these things come into place. That now, if I if I look back, I was like, I don't know why I did that. I I, I don't know like the society and and how it played out. Um, but luckily, um, in in my in college, I was able to um, have an amazing mentor that that spoke to me and, and talked to me about you know what does it mean to be Mexican and all the the we had history lessons. It felt like where you shouldn't feel ashamed or embarrassed of who you are. Uh, on the contrary, this is power. You should be. Uh, you should feel. Oh, proud of how where you came from and and to this day it's like I have a different uh, lens of how I see the world and how I see myself in this in society today and like I said it it's it's a journey that I think um, we all have to take and if we have those opportunities to bring more people and bring more youth into it I think those lenses might change um, but that's my hope that we do have the spaces where we can have those conversations in an environment where we feel safe, where we feel empowered, when we feel where we feel honored, and we can be proud of the heritage we have in the cultura that we have because it's amazing. Um, in in the schools and society, we're just told to to get to strip that we're it's not important, it's devaluing, and so it's a whole different shift. Um, but uh, I think there that we we just need to create those spaces so that we can have those uh, sensitive conversations. 
uh, where we can have those hard conversations. I shouldn't say sensitive, hard and sensitive, both of them, I guess. Um, but uh, for me, it, it didn't really happen until I went to uh, to went to college, and I I wish I would have had more experience as uh, growing up as a as a you know as a teenager. Um, it probably would have made things a lot easier than a lot of the, the barriers and challenges that I had to overcome. So, Meyer, there's a few things that just really struck out to me in in what in your response to that question. Um, and I think if there's if there's one takeaway that we all leave with, it's remembering that regardless of where we're from, our background, our culture, that it's not something to be shy of or embarrassed about or to leave at the door. It's something to be embraced and something that can be a source of strength and power and pride and um, for for each one of us. And um, so that's really beautiful. I really appreciate you saying that. And then secondly, you know, I think for, for us as, as higher education administrators and staff and faculty, your point to how critical it is that we create the space to be able to have these conversations um, and to continue this dialogue and to sit across the table or in this case a Zoom session and hear about, you know, what that is for you, you know, what what can we learn about you and your culture or Shanoa and hers or about me and mine so we have a better understanding and appreciation for what we bring to the table as ourselves and what each one of uh, the others are also bringing to the table in that unique perspective. So thank you both. Um, we have just Something a few that more. I just want to add, Anita. Yes, please. And I just want to give the statement that it's okay if you feel that way. I've, I've been in that situation. The good thing is that if we have the openness to learn and be part of those conversation, I think that's how we can move forward. Um, I, I don't want to punish or, you know, be in that situation. Oh, you don't know your, your, where you came from, your heritage. No, this creates spaces where we have opportunities to learn and grow together. And I think being in an educational environment, we have those opportunities. It's a great, great clarification and great point, Myra. Thank you. So with just a few minutes left, I'd like to uh, move into some closing statements from each of our panelists. Uh, just if you have a, a, a little bit of a wisdom or suggestion or advice or call to action for our attendees today. And we'll start with you, Shanoa, and then have you uh, wrap up, Myra. Thank you, Anita, and thank you, Myra. Um, I think that conversation really resonated with me. Um, so I just want to give a, a brief, you know, closing statement in that um, one thing that I didn't touch up on on my presentation was the, uh, Indigenous children. I did talk about it a little bit. Um, however, I just want to remind the audience and just continue to remind myself in that Indigenous children in the history of this country the, from the foundations, very foundations, were never, it was never okay to be themselves. It was never okay to be indigenous in this country. Um, and so I think that's, the, that's my takeaway. And, and, and I hope that's the, the, that was my learning outcome. And I hope that that's something that you learned today is that because it wasn't okay for them to be indigenous, it's not okay for people to act indigenous today. Um, it's not okay to appropriate. And um, I just think that growing up in this valley, it's, it's very much been a constant struggle in my life, but due to my involvement and my deep, rich understanding of my culture, both Apache and Pueblo, I've been able to overcome. And like Myra, I've been able to overcome by many mentors in my life um, that have supported me through my, my identity. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my takeaway from this. And I hope that you can all kind of breathe from this, uh, get some downtime from this because it's a lot of heavy topics that we're discussing. Um, it might, might be tri triggering for some too. So I'm open to questions. I'm always here as your resource. Um, please do not hesitate to reach out to me for support. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Shanoa. Yes. Myra. Thank you so much for having me being, you know, for allowing me to be part of this conversation that is really important to me. And like I was telling Chanel, it brought up a lot of memories of me growing up and who I am now and uh, that I, I believe we still have people, students in our community that might feel this way and are living through these situations. Um, like I said before, um, 
I think we are in a, in a good uh, space where we can have open conversations about who we are and who we're, rec who we're becoming as individuals. Um, but, and coming together to really acknowledge our differences, to learn about our cultures, I think we can, ha I've really created an amazing community where we celebrate each other. And um, I definitely have felt this way uh, since I started my, you know, my post-secondary education and, and living in this community. I see diversity all over and I am honored to be part of this community. I, I love Taos. It has really grown into me. Um, and I have, I have established amazing friendships uh, along the way that have helped, helped me grow as an individual. Um, so uh, don't take that for granted. You know, we, we're in the perfect space and let's learn from each other. Let's come together as a community. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Myra and Shanoa. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to share on be, in closing on behalf of you and of Taos, Myra and Shanoa, we're so fortunate to have you both as part of the Lobo Familia, as we say, and have your voices and perspectives informing our policies and practices and how we can better serve students. Uh, we thank you both for sharing of your time, your knowledge, your experience, and your hearts with us today. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you being with us. I want to also thank all of our attendees for joining us. We hope that um, you'll, you know, you will sit with and take some time, as Shanoa said, to just kind of process what you've heard and learned today. Uh, we did share both Shanoa and Myra's uh, contact information there in the chat box. You can reach out to them via email. I'm sure they'll both be welcome to. Uh, if you have any things that come up that you'd like to chat through or visit with them about, I'm sure they'd both be happy to, uh, to do so. Uh, we will be uh, sharing the recording and with the present presenter's permission, the copies of the slides out as well. Uh, so you can look forward to those uh, sometime later this week. So in the meantime, we'll just wish you all uh, a great day. Uh, stay warm, stay safe, and stay well, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.